We are in week 15 of a learning series that we're calling Jesus Amazed, where we are talking all about faith. We're talking about how to have faith that amazes God, not just faith that pleases God. And as followers of Jesus, we get our definition of faith from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is what we've been learning from the very beginning of this learning series. It says, faith is the assurance, it's the title deed, it's the confirmation of things hoped for or divinely guaranteed. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. It's a conviction of my reality because sometimes my reality doesn't match up with what my conviction is. My reality, my physical reality does not line up with what I'm believing God for. So faith is the conviction of my reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Then in verse 6 of the same chapter, we read that without faith, it's impossible to please God because he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so We can have a level of faith that pleases God. We can have shallow faith. We can come to church. We can worship. We can know Jesus existed. We can know Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that we're going to make it to heaven because we have salvation by grace through faith, not by works so that no one can boast. Or we can have faith to believe that God will do what no one thought he could, would, or should do. We can have faith for miracles, for the absolutely impossible. We can have faith to believe that God can break barriers in our life, that we built our Ourselves. We can have faith to believe that God can break down barriers that other people have built around us. We can believe that God will break chains off of us, bondage out of us. He can give us free. We can have faith to believe that God will do what no one thought he could, would, or should do. And several weeks ago in this learning series, we did a message called Talk the Talk Before You Walk the walk. How many of you were here for that? Talk the talk before you walk the walk. And what we talked about, we discussed this idea that before we start acting in faith, we've got to start talking in faith. We have to learn to change our communication from negative to positive, from faithless to faith-filled, from hopeless to hate, hopeful. And so we, we have to have this mindset that our, our, our speech has to change. But if we're not careful, what will happen is we'll get so stuck on talking the talk that we forget that we also have to walk the walk. I grew up in an era of church that had a large uh, microscope on people when it came to their confession. We were taught in, in the church era of the 90s that positive confession was everything. And we do believe that here as well. Again, talk the talk, faith talk. You have to learn to talk what you believe. But it got so dangerous, it got to such an unhealthy level that if I showed up to church with 104 degree fever and I'm about to pass out and I say, oh my gosh, I have a fever, I'm about to pass out, that's wrong in the name of Jesus. You don't say that, you don't speak that. And it would hurt people because it's not like I'm having a negative confession. I'm just telling you, like, bro, I got a fever. (laughs) Like, I'm about to, can you, I'm just telling you so you can catch me. And it can get to an unhealthy place where we start to say things like, don't you ever say anything wrong? Don't you ever confess this? And it got, it got to a point where it was dogmatic on people. And let me tell you why that's so dangerous. Because you can teach people all day to confess, 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 positive confession, faith-filled confession, but if all they've learned is to talk out faith, but they never learn to walk in their faith, they'll never see a miracle. And the reason why it's dangerous is because we taught positive confession over and over, but because there was never a shift into action, miracles and prayers were not being answered, and what it made people believe is that the God they confessed to be their Savior, the God they confessed to be the miracle worker, actually didn't show up, and their trust in God dwindled. And so we have to have a balanced teaching of not just talking, but also walking out our faith. You can get stuck talking. So I want to give you a message today that I've I've titled, You're Just Talking. Look at somebody say, you're just talking. You're just talking. I want to talk to you about the fact that you're just talking. In Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 1, there's a story where Jesus has a conversation with his disciples about just talking. And it starts out like this. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It'd be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. And here's what Jesus is saying. 
It does not matter what season of life you live in. It does not matter what era of history you live in. There will be things that will cause us to stumble. There will be things that will be obstacles to our faith. There will be, but woe to those who cause those things to happen. Woe to those who deceive people, manipulate people. Woe to them. He said, watch yourselves. And then he gives them this declaration. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. Rebuking people does not mean getting on Facebook and writing a 12-paragraph long statement of what they did wrong to you. just want to clarify that. Rebuking means that you go to them privately and you say, hey, I heard that you did this. Hey, you did this to me. Hey, you're messed up in this area. And if they repent, repentance means they acknowledge what they did and they turn away from it. They say, you're absolutely right. I'm going to change this. Then here's what you do. Then you forgive them. Now, even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you, what's that word? Must. You must forgive them. This is a very hard truth because this is not a suggestion. This is a command from Jesus. Even if someone comes back to you, sins against you seven times in one day and says, I repent. Okay, I forgive you. The next verse blows my mind. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And here's why this is so hilarious to me. Because these guys had been traveling with Jesus and seen Jesus raise people from the dead. They had seen Jesus open blind eyes. They, they saw him spit in the mud and put mud on a blind man's eyelids. And then when he washed it away, his sight came back. They had walked on water with Jesus. They had cast out demons with Jesus. They had healed the sick. They had raised the dead. But forgive somebody? Oh, Lord, I need faith for that. That's too much. That's crossing the line, Jesus. I'll bring them back from the dead, but I, forgiving somebody? No, Jesus, I need faith for that. And Jesus set the record straight. He said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, mustard seed is about that big, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted, be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. There's two words that I think people focus on when we dissect this passage of Scripture. There's another story where Jesus was walking with His disciples, and Jesus says a very similar passage. He says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and it will obey you. And so Jesus is talking about big items here, and and He's using a, 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 uh, I I don't know if the word is metaphor, but He's using an, an example of size to get us to understand the correlation between faith and obstacles faith and things that are in our way. And what we do is we get stuck on two particular words. We get stuck on the word small and the word say. I know for myself, uh, um, there were times in my life, again, I grew up in a church era where faith, positive confession, uh, they, they, there's a title, Word of Faith, and that's how we kind of coined this phrase, uh, uh, was a big idea in the church that we should say positive things, we should say faith-filled things. And again, we believe that here, but again, not to a dogmatic point of view. But we can get stuck on the word small. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, and here's where I think people get caught up. We believe that if our miracle doesn't happen immediately, if we believe that if our miracle doesn't happen just the timing that we ask God for it to happen, if, if it doesn't happen just like what we wanted it to happen, or, or, or maybe there's a postponement of the miracle, or maybe, let, let me just throw it out there, maybe it just doesn't happen at all. Then here's what we think. I must not have had enough faith. I didn't have enough faith. If I just, if I just had more faith, Oh, if I just had, if I had Stephen's size faith, man, my pastor, he's got faith. He'll pray for you. You got cancer. He'll pray for you. You'll get healed. I wish I had that kind of faith. You ever looked at somebody and said, I wish I had their faith? I wish I could believe like they believed. And you know what Jesus did? He helped them understand that it's not about how much faith you have. It's the fact that you have faith at all. If you have faith as small, let me set you free from some demonic thinking. 
If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can speak to a mulberry tree and cause it to be uprooted and thrown into the sea. If you have faith as small as a seed, you can move a mountain. If you have faith as small as a seed, you can move a tree. So in other words, it's not the size of your faith that's important. It's the fact that you have faith in the first place. The reason why we got to get this down into our core is also because he said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can speak to a mulberry tree. I was taught that the seed of faith that you have has to be the same type of seed as the thing you're speaking to. But can I tell you something? Jesus said, if you got a mustard seed, you can move a mulberry tree. In other words, your faith doesn't always look like the thing you're trying to move. Sometimes your faith won't even be for a healing of cancer. You'll be believing for a healing of sniffles, but you'll still get the healing of cancer because you had faith enough to believe God for the healing of the sniffles. If you got faith as small as a seed, you can tell a tree to get up out, and it'll move. But we also get cut up, caught up on say. We say, well, I got to say to the mountain. And so we, we have our positive confession. We're praying in the morning, God, I just thank you. And we get our Jesus Amaze cards out. And by the way, did y'all find your Jesus Amaze cards? I talked about that a few weeks ago. Some of y'all are still like, ooh, I don't know. Uh, Get our Jesus Amazed cards out, start reading it line for line. We're believing God to do. God's going to do this. God's going to do that in the year 2020. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to get a car. I'm going to get a house. I'm going to get a wife, get a husband. I'm going to do this. I'm going to heal the sick, raise the dead. Oh, it's awesome. And we get so caught up on saying the right things that we forget to take action on what God told us to do. There's nothing wrong with positive confession. There's nothing wrong with faith-filled words. But words are not enough to produce a miracle. Let me say it this way. The uprooting of the mulberry tree is phase one in the miracle process. Here's why I say that. If you uproot any kind of tree, and, and notice Jesus said uproot. If you pull a tree out of the ground, what is left behind from that tree? A oh, hole. <laughs> true. But what else, what did that tree actually, this is not a trick question, by the way. What did, what did that tree leave behind after you uprooted? Not roots, because you uprooted the entire thing. What's left or right? Who said it? Seeds. Every plant produces after its own kind. God intended for plants to reproduce. It is a defense mechanism of them so that they can carry on their lineage. We'll say it that way. They always are dropping seeds every season. New season forms, new seeds grow, they fall. If you have an oak tree like we do in our yard, there's acorns everywhere. I cannot stand it because I'll be trying to rest in my living room on my nice big giant recliner and all of a sudden a tree, the wind will hit and this giant acorn will go pop and then just all the way down my roof. I cannot stand it. Trees are always producing seed, and what happens is we have faith like a mustard seed. That's great, but when you uproot the mulberry tree, what's left over is a bunch of mulberry seeds all on the ground, and what most of us try to do is we try to plant faith seeds without acting on a cleanup of the leftover mulberry seeds. It's great that you uprooted your anxiety. You prayed over it, and you're free from it. That's awesome. But if you take too much time to plant some new seeds in the ground, what will happen is you will have an anxiety forest where you used to have an anxiety tree. You'll have an addiction forest, before, whereas last time you only had an addiction tree because we didn't take action. So how do we reconcile this? Let's go to James chapter 2. If you are a follower of Jesus and you feel good in your relationship with God, you feel safe, you feel comfortable, I want you for the rest of this year to go do a study in the book of James. James will make you feel horrible about your Christianity, and from time to time, we need this. Let me tell you who James was. James was the brother, the biological brother of Jesus, Joseph and Mary's son. After Jesus, James. Now think about what that looks like. Anybody have a sibling rivalry with their siblings? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Some of y'all are sitting next to me. You're like, mm-hmm. Can you imagine the sibling rivalry between Jesus and James? James, I wish you would be more like Jesus. He's the son of God. You want me to hit that level of excellence? Jesus makes straight A's. You make all A's and one B. I wish you could be more like Jesus. 
Jesus rescued the drowning kid by walking on top of the water and then pulling him out. I wish you would be more like Jesus. James had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder for a while there because he's denying the godliness of Jesus. Because just imagine, you siblings, if your brother was God and you were told you had to bow down and worship him. Oh, if my brother ever said that to me, I would kick him so fast in the face. <laughs> bow down, worship me. Whoosh, done. But when James realized who Jesus actually was after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he had a revelation of his relationship with his brother that was brand new. And James became a pastor. He began pastoring people, feeding the people of God. And one of James's main ideas was that as followers of his brother Jesus, we had to make changes in our lives if what we say we believe is ever going to actually come to fruition. Because James was in a, uh, a, a, an era of time after Jesus was res resurrected where people would go from town to town talking about the miracles of Jesus, but slowly but surely there became fewer and fewer miracles why? Because everybody was focused on talking and not action. There were people who were saying, yes, I put my faith in Jesus, but there wasn't any fruit from it. And so James, in, cha in, in, in chapter 2 of his letter, here's what he writes. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if somebody claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them. Now, let's take this, let's go back. Can such faith save them? I, I'm going to make a declaration here. This is not meant to hurt you, but this is meant to help you. Think logically about this. Can a faith without deeds actually save you? Let me say it this way. If your lifestyle does not start transforming into what you say you believe, maybe you aren't really saved. I love that groan when I say stuff like that. Mm. Ooh, I don't know about that one. Oh, that's a little tough to swallow. Maybe you're not really saved. Maybe that's why you still drop F-bombs in the church foyer. Maybe you're not really saved. That's why you keep cheating on your wife. Maybe you're not really saved. You, say you're, I can say, you can say you're saved all day, but is there any action behind your faith? I, I know this is going to scare you. There are a lot of people who claim they're going to heaven, and when the time actually comes, the place they end up is going to be a lot hotter than heaven. Jesus said it himself. He said, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. You're either a sheep or you're a goat. How do you know the difference? Does what you do line up with your faith? Can such faith save them? But Stephen, we're not saved by works. It's not about what we do. You're absolutely right. Ephesians says that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. You're absolutely right. But when you put your faith in the grace of God, that transformative grace has to start taking effect or else your faith is useless in your salvation. There has to be a change. That's a totally different message. I'm going to keep going. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go in peace, keep well fed, but does nothing, what good is it? What good is it? By the way, what good is it when you find out that someone is struggling in their life and all you do is let me pray for you? There's some times where prayer is good, but we use prayer as a defense mechanism to keep people at an arm's length because we don't want to deal with their mess. Can we just say, honestly, this is what it is. Hey, I'm struggling with my finances. We can't feed our family. Oh, let me pray for you. How is praying for them going to help their feed their family? Go get them a grocery card. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? I know it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to swallow. First service, too, they were just looking at me like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. They ain't me. Prayer is good, but don't use prayer as a defense mechanism to keep people at arm's length. Start taking action on what you're praying. Hey, God, we're praying that you are going to uh, redeem the curse. We're praying that you're going to financially bless them. Okay, now let's go down to Kroger and get you a $100 gift card so you can feed the kids this week. But then we get into this, but what about me? Well, if I do that for them, then who's going to take care of me? Why is it you just prayed for God? I'm off on a tangent today, but I feel the Holy Spirit today. Why is it? 
Why is it that you're going to pray for someone else to get a miracle from God, and when God tells you to perform the miracle for them, you won't trust the same God to perform a miracle for you? Oh, my God, that is so good. That needs to be tweeted. Where was I? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Good. Demons believe that God is one, that there's only one God. They shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence? Keep going. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Maybe it's not that you don't have faith, maybe you have a partial faith. You need a completeness of faith, which means you take action on your faith. I love that he keeps going, the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. And just to take it to the next level, he says you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by, what, by, not by faith alone. In the same way, and he calls out everybody, he takes it to the lowest level, he says Rahab the prostitute the hoe, the whore. He talked about a whore when he talked about faith. Just to let everybody know, if you think you're too good for this, no, no, let me talk about a prostitute that had faith and was considered righteous because she gave lodging to the 12 spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Your faith without deeds is dead dead. Now let's break this apart. I want to give you three things about faith from both of these passages of scripture, Luke 17 and and this one right here in James chapter 2, about how faith works. Number one, write this down, faith works like a seed. Faith works like a seed. He said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, we take out the idea that Jesus said seed, but in a couple weeks, I'm going to talk to you about the anatomy of a miracle, and a miracle requires a seed. There has to be faith as the seed. After the uprooting, after you uproot the anxiety, are you sowing faith in peace? After the uprooting of your addiction, are you sowing faith in freedom? What are you sowing? Because if you don't sow something in place of what was uprooted, those mulberry seeds that were left behind, like I said, they'll leave a forest of all kinds of mess that you used to have. Are you sowing seeds of faith? Are you taking action on your faith? Which leads me to the second point. When you have faith like a seed, what you do will start to take the place of what you say. What you do will take the place of what you say. You cannot take a seed, put it in the ground, and just start talking it into existence. Come on, apple tree. You can do it. Come on, apple tree. Yeah, come on. Daddy needs some apples. You can do it. Woo! You can't, you can't encourage a seed enough to split up out of the ground and produce fruit. You cannot talk fruit into existence just because you planted a seed. There has to be action. What do you have to do to cultivate it? Number one, you got to clean up the ground around it. You have to retill the soil so that it's on good soil. Oh, we're going to talk about that in a couple weeks too. It's on good soil, not rocky soil, not reused soil. You got to pull up weeds. You got to water it. You got to make sure it's got some good sunshine. You got to scare away the birds. You got to take some action on your faith. See, you can tell me all day, Pastor Stephen, I'm believing I'm free from this addiction to pornography. Praise God in Jesus' name, I'm free from this. And guess what? I will be in agreement with you. We will pray for you. It will be awesome. Praise the Lord. But until you get some software that blocks all the porn on your computer, on your phone, on your TV, on your tablet, on your watch, on your, in your car, wherever you go, with a password that you don't have access to, somebody else does, like your wife, like your husband because by the way, this is not just secluded to men, then guess what? You'll never be free because you still got seeds of pornography addiction everywhere that you never cleaned up. You have to put some action behind your faith. You have to take a step of action. You can tell me all day you're going to be a millionaire. You're going to start a business. It's going to make so much money. I got this grand idea God gave me. Pastor Stephen, guess what? It's going to make so I know a guy. That's all he does is talks about all these things he's going to do, make all this money. Can I tell you something? Until you go buy a book and start reading how to actually start a business, until you go down to the county clerk's office and actually register your business, you don't have a business. You're just talking about a business. 
You can tell me all day long, man, I'm going to believe God. We are going to supply for our family's needs. I'm going to go get a better job. I'm going to make more money. I'm going to make sure my kids are eating every week. And let me tell you, that is great. You can ask me to pray with you. I will pray with you. But until you take action on that faith and stop coming home from work after working another shift at a dead-end job that you've been at for 20 years and getting the Xbox One controller and playing for 12 hours straight through the middle of the night instead of getting on LinkedIn and making some connections with people who might have a job for you and getting on monster.com and reworking your resume. Y'all are quiet today. Guess what? All you're doing is talking about the fruit. You're not actually producing anything. You have to learn to not just talk. You have to learn to take action. And I'm not talking about striving because striving will convince you that if you do the right thing, that it'll come to pass. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you do what only you can do and then let God do what only he can do. All I can do is work on my resume. God as my witness, and he will never write a resume for you. Never. I've prayed. It doesn't work that way. He's never going to write a resume for you. He's never going to call that company and ask to set up a meeting with their HR department to get an interview. He will never do it. I have never had anybody call me for a job and say, uh, yeah, some guy named Jesus the Christ called, uh, <laughs> said you need a job. I figured we would just put you in right now, you know, savior of the universe. Like, well, I guess we'll put him in. God doesn't do that. It's silly to sound like that. But can I tell you, that's the expectation we have in our heart when we don't take action on our faith. We're acting like God's going to do it all for us. No, 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 that's not true, honey. You do what only you can do. Here's what God will do, though. God will work some circumstances out for the right person at the right time to pick up the right phone call for you to make sure that you get the right job in the right cubicle, not next to uh, Naughty Nelly over there who's always trying to get your attention. He's going to put you right next to the uh, uh, 45-year-old black woman who's been in church since she was born, and she can Rondai Shondai with the best of them, and she'll pray over you every day and bless you and give you an anointing you never thought you could have. That's the kind of job I want. Can I tell you something? God will do things that you cannot do. Not if you strive though. You do what you can do and then here's what you do. You say, God, the rest of it is on your grace. Rest of it's on your grace. I can't make it any further without your grace because grace will give you sweatless victory. Grace will take the burden off of you. Grace will take the stress off of you. Stop worrying about the business. It's not yours to worry about. Yours to worry about was starting the business, making the phone calls, getting the referrals. God's going to take care of the rest. Man, this is good. And last but not least, faith is in the seed. Faith works like a seed. And when you have faith like a seed, You'll be, what you do will begin to take the place of what you say, but lastly, you have to understand that faith is also in the seed. The fruit of what you plant, the fruit in the stalk, in the head there, is not faith. The fruit is the miracle, because it's what you've been believing God for. You've been asking God for this thing. The fruit is the miracle. The fruit is not faith. But and by the way, if y'all don't answer this, I just want to tell you, the first service, they did a great job of answering this question. This is not a trick question. It's a very easy question. Some of you in the first service, just shh, shh, shh. I don't I want to see if these second service people know. What is in every fruit? See, y'all, y'all did good too. Good for y'all. In every fruit is more seed. Every fruit reproduces, represents after its own kind. In every apple, there will be apple seeds, unless you genetically modify it to re- remove the seeds. In every watermelon, man, us Texans, we love our watermelon in the summer. Break that watermelon open, what do you got? All those seeds. Sunflower, seeds. I hate to say it, but even broccoli's got seeds. These plants, the fruit of the plant always has seed inside of it. And the seed is there, why? Not to eat, but to plant. So that why? It can produce another miracle. This entire series, we've had the mindset that this whole series was about each of us individually. And I want to tell you something. I tricked you. This whole series wasn't about you. Had nothing to do with you. Yes, you're going to get a miracle out of your faith. That's great. But it had nothing to do with you. My 
whole purpose in teaching this entire series was to get to this point where I get to just see the face of every single person when I say it's not about you. And the anger and the resentment that it's harbored there. Here's why I say this. Because every fruit has seed in its own kind. Every seed, seed like faith in that fruit is not for you to store away. It's for you to scatter to give to someone else so that they can plant seeds of faith where their mulberry tree used to be, that they can produce a miracle and they can take that measure of faith and plant it in someone else's garden and they can help someone else. This whole series, you think, you're thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. Let me take you back all the way to week one. Week one, we talked about the centurion, how he had Jesus amaze faith. And after Jesus healed the young man, here's what it says. The men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Boom, faith. Week two, Jesus turning water into wine in John 2. It said, what did Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Boom, faith. Week three, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness in Luke chapter four. When Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news spread about him all through the whole countryside, he taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. Boom, faith. Week four, the Canaanite woman had a demon-possessed daughter. Jesus takes the demon out of the daughter in Matthew 15. Jesus left there, go back, Jesus left there, went along the Sea of Galilee, and then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. He laid, they laid him at their feet, and Jesus healed them. What is that? That's faith. As soon as they heard that the demon-possessed girl was free, they thought, well, if he can do it for them, he sure enough can do it for me. Boom, faith. Week five, paralyzed man lowered through the roof in Mark chapter two. When he got up, he took his mat, he walked out in full view of them all, and they were amazed, and they praise God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Boom, faith. Week chapter, uh, week six, demon-possessed man is delivered in Mark chapter five. So the man went away and began to tell everybody in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Faith. Week chapter se- or week seven, excuse me, Jesus heals a man born blind in John chapter 10. It says, the Jews who heard this were again divided. Many of them said that Jesus was demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But those who caught faith from this miracle said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Week 8, Peter walks on the water in Matthew 14. When they climb back into the boat, Peter and Jesus, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat began to worship Jesus and said, truly, you are the Son of God. I could hit every single week that we've taken and show you how every miracle of Jesus caused faith to show up in the lives of someone else. So before you get some stinking nasty thinking that your miracle is all about you, I want you to remember the family member who said, I'll never step foot in a church. I will never believe in God. All those church folks are fake. I'll never give my money to God. I'll never raise my hands. I'll never worship Jesus. I don't even believe in Jesus. And remember that day because when a miracle shows up, There will be seeds of faith in them that they cannot deny. The more that you trust God, the more there's people in your area, in your sphere of influence, who will find the real Jesus. Introducing real people to the real Jesus is not just me preaching from a platform. It's you producing fruit from your faith and believing that God will do what no one thought he could do, he would do, he should do. When you've got faith like that, even your your ex-husband, even your ex-wife, even your grandmama, even those people who hate you at work will have to say, I've never seen anything like this. You tell me, what is it that's changed in you? By God, it was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. By his grace, I have been saved. Faith will come alive when you start producing miracles from your faith. So just keep steadily producing. Don't just talk. You've got to take action. Stop just talking. Stop just opening your mouth. Stop just positive confession. Stop just faith-filled confession. No, do something about what you're talking about. Because every fruit is going to produce some seed, and every miracle produces seed that has faith inside of it for another miracle. And the more miracles that are performed, by, do you, 
Let me break down to the basic level. The only reason people believed in Jesus is not because of prophecy. In fact, that was why the Pharisees hated him. Because it had been prophesied 400 years previous in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet wrote down every detail about the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus. They didn't even know what his name was going to be yet. They began to write down, he began to write down all this stuff as the Holy Spirit gave it to him. And then Jesus showed up on the scene and his first thing he does is he goes into the temple and he starts to tell them, I am the one who you have been believing for. And they hated him. So guess what he did to get even? He started raising the dead. He started healing blind eyes, opening deaf ears. He started providing for his disciples supernaturally. When, when, when there's a story how the disciples needed to pay their taxes, and, and, and Peter comes to Jesus. He said, uh, we only got enough for us. And Jesus said, oh, no worry. Go, go fishing. And with the first fish that you catch, there's going to be a gold coin in there. And, and that gold coin is not only going to pay for your taxes, it's going to pay for my taxes. Jesus was such a baller, he did miracles so that he didn't have to pay his own taxes. Oh, da, 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 ba, sh, da, da, da. That's so good right there. Jesus was just performing, and the more miracles he performed, the more the hopeless and the broken and the outcast faith showed up, and they said, I need what this man has. You are a living, breathing kingdom of God on the earth, but if you are not believing God for miracles, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those miracles are going to cause faith to come alive in other people and miracles will begin to spring forth all over this city, all over this country, all over the world. Why? Because a little church called Revive in, Ar in central Arlington of all places had some crackheads, had some whores, had some strippers, had some people who had been through divorce, had some people whose kids had left their house and said, I'm never going to church again, had some things happened in their lives they were hurt they were broken but they saw miracles in you and when you showed up with a miracle they put their faith in Jesus and everything began to change and that's the testament of our church and that's the testament that God wants to do through us at Revive and if you will lay hold of that God will perform miracles in your life just stop talking about it and take some action